Okay, good, good evening. My name is Josh Smith. I'm uh, the director of the American Merchant Marine Museum in Kings Point, New York, uh, on the grounds of the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. And I'm your host tonight uh, to introduce uh, the Border Historical Society's latest speaker, Professor Ronald Reese. And uh, before we uh, commence introducing Professor Reese, I'd like to say the Border Historical Society has these presentations just about monthly. Um, we are a cross-border organization, and we would love to have you as a member in our organization. And for 10 Yankee dollars, you too can be a member of the prestigious and exciting Border Historical Society and, and do it quick before inflation strikes and we have to make it 12 Yankee dollars. Uh, uh, but anyways, we, we really would love to have more people, and I think we do. A I'd be delighted, yeah. Uh, in these presentations. Tonight, it's my very great pleasure to introduce our presenter, Professor Ronald Reese, who was born in Wales. Uh, Ronald Reese taught historical geography at the University of Saskatchewan and as an adjunct professor at Mount Allison University. Uh, he's written books on Canadian prairie landscape and settlement, on garden history, on industrial South Wales, and on the Maritime Provinces. And he's been so lucky to live in St. Andrews for 30 years. Um, and he has authored a, a, a really great book uh, about one of New Brunswick's most fascinating men, William Francis Ganong, a, a guy, if you study New Brunswick history at all, you can't go far before you bump into uh, Mr. Ganong. Uh, and uh, Ronald has written a book about Mr. Ganong uh, entitled New Brunswick Was His Country. Uh, and on that note, I'm going to hand it over to Professor Reese. And thank you for being here. Well, thank you all for tuning in. And thank you for the introduction. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say is, is that my working title for the book wasn't the one you see in front of you, it was uh, that one small head followed by the life and work of William Francis Guénon. And the phrase that one small head comes from a, an 18th century poem by Oliver Goldsmith, an English poet. And the poem was called The Deserted Village. Uh, the village was deserted because the enclosure movement had gobbled up all the villages small holdings to make larger, more profitable farms. And the villagers left the village and that's it was deserted. And in the poem, <clears throat> Goldsmith is wandering around the churchyard, making comments on, on some of the residents. And when he gets to the schoolmaster's residence, he explains how greatly the villagers were in awe of him. The villagers were, for the most part, semi-literate, best, and they thought that the schoolmaster knew everything. And uh, Goldsmith's phrase in the, in the, poem, in the poem is, uh, and still they gazed, and still the wonder grew that one small head could carry all he knew. And that's the standard reaction to anyone who knows anything about Gnome's work. Uh, he, was a, he was an absolute phenomenon. After he died, uh, a federal geographer working in, in St. John made an inventory of, of his published writing. And the total was over 600 pieces. And the, and the range was from books, translations from uh, Acadian French, book length translation, book length monographs in the transactions of the Royal Society of Canada and hundreds of articles, most of them in scholarly magazines, but not all. Uh, Gnome was very much a people's intellectual. Um, today he would be called, I suppose, a public intellectual, uh, but um, he, he, uh, he, 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 he thought that his, his learning should be should be cast wide. Uh, anyway, the um, 
And it, it's often occurred to me that if he'd chosen to write a CV, which, which he never did, uh, in the creative modern manner, he just needed a wheelbarrow to carry it around, probably a dump truck actually. Uh, and as even more um, astonishing than the, the amount that he wrote, was the range of subjects that he tackled. Uh, and the range was from his core subjects, his natural science, he was a natural scientist, and his core subjects were, were botany, uh, zoology, uh, ecology, uh, and physiography. Now he had um, some training, uh, some uh, in, in these subjects, but not in physiography. So on one side you have you had his uh, his natural science subjects. On the other side, non-scientific ones, and these range from the history of cartography of Eastern Canada, uh, of the Maritimes and the North Atlantic, of which he was the authority, uh, to also um, native native culture, Aboriginal culture and languages. <clears throat> and 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 Acadian settlements uh, and also Acadian culture. He he was as one <clears throat> thesis writer to describe him a a one man army of scholars. Yet for all his <laughs> the writing that he did, very little was written about him. There is one essay by the. Uh, provincial uh, botanist, an excellent, an excellent essay, uh, and then um, just two theses, both written for American universities, both very good theses. And I, and of, uh, and I made a scan of Canadian libraries to see how many of them had had the thesis, and it. <laughs> There were only three copies of the thesis in the whole of Canada. Uh, two of them were in the are in the museum of the uh, the provincial museum, the archives of the provincial museum in St. John, uh, and the other is in the rare books room uh, of the uh, library, the UNB library in Fredericton. That's three copies. Um, how to explain that paradox, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> you can have to ask me afterwards and I'll, and I'll try to explain. But um, um, now as for his background, I'm going to show you some slides in, in, in a little while, but they'll make more sense if you, you know something of Gnoy's background. Uh, he was born in 1864 in St. John. And he came to St. Stephen as a boy with his parents and family. Uh, St. Stephen, as I suspect you all know, is neighbor to Callus uh, at the mouth of the East St. Croix. And in those golden days, uh, they, it functioned, they functioned as, as a, almost as a single community. Uh, the Grand family moved there because Grand's father and his uncle decided to open a grocery and a confectionery store in, in St. Stephen. The grocers didn't do terribly well, but the, but, 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 but the, but the candy did. Uh, St. Stephen's a blue collar town, filled with manual workers, and manual workers like that sugar. The, the confectionery did so well that, that, that uh, Gnoy's father and, uh, and Gnoy's uncle decided that they would manufacture the candy themselves. Uh, so what they did was they imported sugar from Cuba and built a small factory in, in St. Stephen and, and the factory flourished. And it's the, the Gnoy candy business is still flourishing. It's the oldest business in St. Stephen and by far the largest employer. Uh, and there would be, but I mean, some hope. Gnong was the eldest child of uh, six or seven, and there would be some hope that 
he would take over the candy business. But from the outset, he was, he was a naturalist, uh, collecting shells, skeletons, insects, and so on, and classifying them. And I suspect his parents realized that they had, they had a prodigy, prodigy on their hands. And to their great credit, they didn't put any pressure on him to work in the chocolate factory. Well, the Penang did spend a couple of summers at it. But they sent him to the grammar school for the, in St. John for the last two years of his high school. And it must have been to the great relief of his teachers in St. Stephen's. So I often wonder what it might, be, might have been like to, to have been on in a botany class. It'd be like having Einstein in the physics class. So after his two years in, in, in St. John at the grammar school, he went to King's College in Fredericton, uh, which later became UNB. And at King's College, he obviously studied natural scientists. And during his years at King's College, he started to write and publish. And his first uh, publications were for the Bulletin of the Natural History Society in St. John. It was a flourishing society. Uh, and Gnong's articles were, were about the marine life of Passamaquoddy Bay. Uh, and the National, Hist National History Society was a kind of open university in those days. People who couldn't afford to go to, to King's College, and most couldn't, would go to classes and lectures at the Natural History Society. And Gnong was uh, supported it all his life or until the demise of the society anyway. And when the society did eventually fold into about 1916 or 1917, somebody did a count of uh, the number of articles that Ganong had written, another count on its way. <laughs> and the, the number came to about 130, which was about one third of the articles uh, written for the for the bulletin. The bulletin was a very well received uh, journal and it, copies of it went to the UK and copies to the, to the US. Um, when he finished at, at, uh, at King's, Gnong took a year off and then he drifted down to Massachusetts, I don't quite know how this happened. And he gave a number of lectures for the uh, Worcester Natural History Society. And that for the following fall, he enrolled in Harvard. Um, and Harvard then was Mecca for mar maritime students because it was close by and its degrees were uh, more prestigious than, than, than maritime degrees. And in Ganong's year, there were about 40 students from the Maritimes at, at Harvard. At Harvard, he, he studied both botany and zoology, but he, he, he inclined toward botany. Um, his professor at Harvard uh, was George Goodill, a, a very well-known botanist. Um, and at Harvard, Gnong obviously must have decided that he would pursue an academic career. It was the obvious, obvious route for, it, for him to take. Um, and so to Harvard he went. He was married by this time. I mean, he married young. And at Harvard, uh, he, he sailed to Germany. Um, and uh, I'm sorry. I, I'm, in order to pursue an academic career, he, he needed more qualifications. And the passport to, to uh, a job at American University uh, in those days was a German PhD. Uh, and on the boat that Gnong and his wife sailed to Germany from, from New York, there were 500 American students all headed for for uh, American universities. Um, and Gnong's destination was, was Munich. 
And at Munich, he wrote a, uh, a thesis on cactus. He'd never, been to, he'd never been to a desert, but there were cactus plants in the greenhouses or plant houses at, at Harvard and also at Munich. And he finishes the degree in two years. It normally took three. Uh, he, he wrote it in German and defended it in German, um, uh, which is remarkable. And it was a, a groundbreaking thesis. It, I, I'm not a botanist, so I can't explain why it was groundbreaking, but the subject was a young cactus, uh, its growth and its morphology, its, its, its shape. Um, and Stephen uh, um, uh, Stephen uh, Clyden, the, the archivist that the the um, botanist at the, at the museum did a botany search for me and Ganon's thesis was still being cited as late as 2003. Um, while he was at Ganon, while he was at Harvard, uh, Clark Seeley, the, the president of Smith College, decided that he would he would like to have a botany department at Smith. Uh, and Seeley wrote to um, George Goodale, uh, Gunnar's professor at Harvard, and asked if he would recommend someone to 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 found a. Uh, a botany department. Uh, Seeley sent a short list back and at the very top of it was, was Ganon's name. So uh, Seeley wrote to, to Ganon and uh, offered him the job. And as a kind of footnote, an uh, afternote in his letter, he said, my offer isn't conditional upon your declaring the degree. Uh, can you imagine a college president saying that today? Of course you can't. Um, uh, Julie didn't think much of uh, German PhDs, neither did Ganon as it happens. He didn't think much of Germany at all. Um, so, um, um, Smith would get his botany in part. And I should say that in those days, Botany was regarded as a very suitable subject for uh, for women's colleges, Smith is a women's college, as I'm sure you all know. And it, it was regarded as a suitable, it was, it was preferred to biology because biology required the, the, the section of animals. Um, but as important as that was the, was that the, the sex life of, of plants is, is more discreet than that, of, than that of animals. I'm sure that didn't affect Seeley's decision very much, but it, 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 that was generally true. Um, botany was, 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 was a favorite subject in, in I suspect, all women's colleges. Um, so from Munich, uh, Smith and uh, Ganon and his wife went uh, to uh, Northampton in, in Massachusetts, the home of Smith College. And that, in a sense, was the beginning and end of Ganon's academic life. He never left Smith. He was there for 32 years. And the pattern of his life at Smith was also, uh, was also very straightforward. Uh, he, he spent his winters in, in Northampton um, and his summers in New Brunswick. And that was a, a pattern that was broken only once or twice in 40 years. Um, and at, at Smith, uh, once installed there, Ganong obviously began writing. Uh, and interestingly, Clark Seeley didn't demand writing of, of his professors. And, um, and Ganon thought actually that, that, that 
very few people were 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 were, were, were uh, suited for research, and um, uh, he didn't he didn't press research on his department members. Thank you. Um, so he started writing at Smith, and for the first twenty years, he wrote uh, his subject was botanical. He wrote about his thesis, he expanded his thesis, and he wrote on the flora of New Brunswick, on raised bogs, uh, the, the uh, salt marshes at the head of the Bay of Fundy. And, and Gnong's approach was ecological. Uh, he was interested in the relation of plants to environment and the relation between plants. Up till the late 19th century, uh, botanical uh, botany had been, a, had been a matter of classification, and Ganong and and the uh, botanists of his age turned to to to, to ecology. Um, and his writings in uh, on botany uh, got him the. Uh, his reward for, for the writings was, was the presidency of the American Botanical Society in 1908 and 1909. Um, and at the end of his presidency, he announced that he was no longer going to write about Boston. <laughs> um, he thought that uh, from then on, that point on, advances in botany would come from laboratory work, field laboratories and laboratories at large institutions. And he was a field man, um, and in any case, Smith couldn't afford you know, large expensive bottoms. And his, um, but he obviously wasn't giving up research and writing. And he announced that from then on, he would concentrate on New Brunswick. Uh, he thought the history, natural history, the social history uh, of New Brunswick had been neglected, and that he was going to to fill in in the gaps. And his vehicles for doing this would be long articles, long uh, long uh, monographs in the uh, Transactions of the Royal Society of Canada. He wrote about seven of these. He, uh, he wrote many articles besides that for for, for, for journals and magazines. Um, but he never finished his, his comprehensive history of the province, but he got, he got very close. Uh, now I, I'm going to show you some pictures. I think you've probably heard enough of my voice without, without illustrations. Um, uh, this, uh, oh no, this is the way. Uh, oh, this, is, this picture of Ganong, by the way, is everybody's favorite. He was a handsome man, and he's in his he's in his prime there. He's about forty. He's also in his element, and his element was anywhere in the New Brunswick woods. So that's uh, many of you will recognize this. This is College Hall at Smith College, uh, as it was when Ganong got there. And Smith uh, opened in eighteen seventy five. Uh, so Ganong got there twenty years after the opening. This is a photograph of the uh, plant house at Smith. It's called the Lyman Plant House because the uh, funds for it were, were donated by the Lyman family uh, who lived in, of, from Northampton. They were very generous to Smith. But while he was in Germany, Grong went to uh, visit London uh, and went to Kew Gardens. And the plant house is modeled after the plant house at Kew. It's much smaller, uh, but it's, it's the same design. And the dome-like top was to, was to accommodate uh, tall tree plants. Uh, the greenhouses to the side were, in a sense, uh, classrooms. And I'll show you a design of those. Um, here we are. Uh, the greenhouse 
behind or at the side of the of the plant house were divided into rooms uh, um, in which the climate and humidity could be controlled to simulate climates in various parts of the world. And I'm not sure how, how much you can see, but yeah, there's a tropical house, uh, an acacia and cactus house, cool temperate, and, um, uh, and a warm temperate house. And on each side of the, of the, of the greenhouse are the experimental plots uh, that uh, the students worked in or worked on. I should say too that the, the design of the grounds at, at Smith uh, were done by the firm of, um, of Frederick Law Olmsted. Frederick Law Olmsted designed Central Park uh, and his company uh, designed many of the, of the, uh, of the uh, campuses in, in, uh, in the Eastern States. Uh, this uh, is a photograph courtesy of Pam Beveridge. <laughs> when I sat in Northampton, I ran out of time and I didn't get to see Gnome's house. Uh, and Gnome's house uh, uh, is on the right. Pam, Be Pam Beveridge sent me the, uh, sent me the, the slide. Um, and it's very much a professor's house, I, I, I would say. Uh, this kind of house you'd expect the to live in. One of his near neighbors um, on Prospect Heights is, was Calvin Coolidge. And you know, and Cal Calvin Coolidge very often walked to us together. This was before uh, Coolidge's presidency. <clears throat> and they walked down, down slope, uh, Gnong veered off to Smith, and Coolidge went down to his uh, downtown office. And uh, Coolidge, as a president, isn't one of um, the, the favorite presidents, but Gnong liked him and admired him. And he thought that uh, he wasn't understood by the intelligence, so that's Gnong's word. Uh, but the, the but the people, the public liked him, and he 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 told um, Coolidge that his, perhaps his one is failing as during his presidency or one failing was that he didn't understand uh, Europe, and for Gnong to say that is quite remarkable, as I'll explain in in a moment. Um, Now, if I was to choose one illustration which, which encaps encapsulates uh, Gnong's spirit, is this one. Um, these are his entries for his 1893 and his 1894 diaries. diaries. He was a keen diarist. For every other year of his adult life, he, he kept a diary. Uh, 1893, as you can see, in Europe, walk in Tyrol and Switzerland. And then 1894 in Europe, Munich and England, which is when he went to, which was when he went to um, Kew. But at the bottom, <laughs> he has written mighty homesick for New Brunswick. Um, now, how he can be homesick for New Brunswick and walking in tea in, in the mountains of the Tyrol and, uh, and Switzerland, I really don't know. Um, he, he, um, he not only did he dislike the the, the sort of landscape, uh, he, he found it too civilized, too tame. But what he liked was wilderness, um, and uh, he tried canoeing uh, in German rivers, and that didn't satisfy by my satisfy him either. Uh, he didn't much like. Uh, Munich, the University of Munich, he found it cold and so sort of unfriendly. Um, and he couldn't get back to, to New Brunswick uh, on, and, and New England fast enough. And 
shortly after he got back to New Brunswick, he he went canoeing with his brother on the, the Mag Mag Magra David River, which is above St. George. Magra is a rough river and it's rough country. And in a, a section of, of the river where the, 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 the woods had been burned over, burnt, um, and it must have looked rather like a First World War a battle um, landscape with uh, isolated trees burned to a crisp. And <laughs> in, this, in this section, uh, Vinong stopped the canoe and turned to his brother and said, how I, how I longed for that, for such, such as this. And when I first read it, I thought he was being ironic, but no, he wasn't. Really. He was being absolutely serious. Uh, New Brunswick has never had a more devoted, uh, devoted follower. Um, so we go on. Ah, this is a, a naturalist party in in Fredericton. And it's easy to see who the who the captain of the who the leader of this expedition is, <laughs> uh, standing next to him, holding the, the oars, is Mrs. Benong. Uh, and at his feet is a man called Sam Kane, who is a customs officer and a very good naturalist. And next to Sam Kane is Benong's sister Susan, a pert looking figure. She became the. Uh, Principal uh, and owner, or part owner, anyway, of a of a um, of a private girls' school in Rosse, a, a suburb of Saint John, and her home and her cottage on the Kennedy Cases was Gnong's summer base. Uh, I, there is Gnong's newly married at this point, and. Uh, his wife, uh, her name was Susan or Jean Murray Carmen. The Carmens was were a prominent uh, Episcopalian, uh, sorry, Anglican family in 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 uh, in Tredicum. My Episcopalian is is uh, uh, American Anglicans, uh, and she and her parents wanted them to marry in the cathedral in in Fredericton. And Ganong and, and Susan went to uh, see the, the bishop, a bishop, his name was Bishop Medley. And Ganong, Ganong's mischievous. And I'm sure he was testing Medley. He told Medley, I am a Darwinian. And he probably told him he was, agnostic, he was an agnostic, if nothing more serious. <laughs> well, he, he got a reaction, but that's not the one he wanted from there. Medley actually showed them the door. He refused to marry them. Uh, he was a creationist, obviously. And to marry, uh, Jean Murray's brother, Bliss Carmen, Bliss Carmen, uh, is a very well-known uh, Anglican poet, and he was at Benong, He was at Harvard with Benong. and uh, can I, anyway, the Carmen uh, scooted down to Boston, found uh, a, a, an Episcopalian minister who had married them. They were married in Boston, and from Boston they went to they went to they went to New York. Uh, and this is a, a map of, of uh, Gnong's stamping ground. It's the map of central and northern New Brunswick. Uh, and it's labeled the Great New Brunswick Wilderness. And this part of New Brunswick had not been mapped, it had scarcely been explored. And Gnong's mission uh, for the, his last of Second twenty years in 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 at Smith was to canoe up and down every river in in this part of the province, and I think he did. Uh, he was very interested in, in the life history, the physiography of rivers. Um, 
And he claims that he, he is fluid or pulled up and down, up and down every, every, one, of these, every one of these rivers. And the, uh, this part of the province is north of, north of Fredericton. And this is Canonge uh, Wilderness Creed. Uh, the finest strip of all, I, I'll read some of it. Uh, go with a strong young man uh, and loving the woods. Uh, take a light canvas canoe, uh, each, or light canvas canoes, each pulling his own, the luggage divided, uh, get off at Perth, it's on the St. John Valley, uh, pull up the beak, don't investigate it, uh, and eventually get back to, to Perth by train. Uh, take a month for it, uh, make careful preparation, climb hills and sound lakes, great, do it all slowly. That was in 1898. And here is Benon at his plane table. The country he was exploring had not been mapped. Uh, and Benon made his own, uh, his own large-scale maps uh, uh, at a scale of roughly an inch or two inches to the mile. Um, and his models were the Ordnance Survey maps of the, of, of the British Ordnance, or maps of the British Ordnance Survey, uh, and also American, American uh, had done much more large scale mapping than, than ours and used those as his models too. Uh, so there he is at his plain table. And this is the kind of map that he, that he made. He, 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 he could have made a living as photography. He, he could draw, uh, he could draw very well. Uh, and this is simply a, 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 a map at a, of North Lake, as you can see, at roughly a scale of, of an inch of an inch to a mile. And here is another one. Now this one is near the uh, the uh, the main border. Uh, and Gidong, uh did a lot of work on the border. He wrote a he wrote a, a, a long treatise, a monograph actually on the uh, on the geographical borders, concentrating on the main border. Um, and um, um, anyway, I go to the next slide. I won't. Try. Oh. Uh, these slides of, of Grand Manan, um, and the date is 1888. Uh, Gidon was in um, Harvard at this time, and uh, uh, this is one of his the summer ex summer excursions uh, of that of that year, and. The figure on the left is Gnong was not only was, was he a good cartographer, he could have lived, made a living as a cartoonist. He, he, he had a very adept pen. Um, and he was in his youth, in his young years, and he, he was very mischievous. Um, and, <laughs> uh, and these drawings really are, are cartoons. The figure, the small figure on the left, of course, is Gunong giving instructions and hoping that the the figure on the on the plank will will fall off. Um, and uh, you can see his mischief in the in the in, in the creature in the bottom right of your screen. There, it's, it's a kind of monster. Um, Gnong, um, uh, in his treatise on the on the borders in the Brunswick, and, 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 and in the section on on the uh, on the um, main New Brunswick uh, border, he said that uh, New Brunswickers were very fortunate 
to them to have Grand Manan. In fact, if you're, New Brunswick had no right to Grand Manan, uh, nor to, um, to Campobello. Uh, Grand Manan is nearer the uh, uh, main than it is New Brunswick. And Campobello, of course, is within kissing distance of New Brunswick. Uh, and uh, uh, they became Grand Manan and, and uh, Campobello became New Brunswick acquisitions almost through a state, not through a state of hand, but through very canny dealing. And the exchange was uh, free movement of American goods, chiefly lumber uh, and agricultural goods on the Upper St. John. And in exchange for, for these favors, the Americans gave up um, Grand Manan and and Campobello, which was an absolute steal. Uh, the American negotiators um, insisted that uh, Moose Island, East Port, should remain American because that gave America access to Passamaquoddy Bay. Um, but and and Campobello are, are uh, to this day uh, Canadian. Uh, on his field trips every summer, uh, when Gnon went into the bush, um, he, he made daily notes and his notebooks were five by seven uh, size and covered with his tiny handwriting. Uh, there are 80 of these and at the St. John Museum, uh, the Magic Museum in St. John, um, I went through a great many of them, <laughs> uh, straining my eyes. Uh, the cartoon on the right is, 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 it is in effect a cartoon. Uh, the figure on the left is Gnong, a tiny figure. The large figure on the right uh, is, um, uh, is Parson Neal of Woodstock. Um, he was a, um, a classmate of, of Gnong's um, and very full of himself. Gnong, I think, did not like, did not, did not like, uh, did not like uh, the clergy. <laughs> And here he is, um, sort of paying obeisance. Um, uh, this is another good on drawing. Uh, the figure on the right uh, is um, uh, his. Is the is the uh, is a very knowledgeable uh, knowledgeable um, um, malice. Um, his his serious, well, I can't can't think of his Christian name. Is was Paul. That is wrong on the left. Um, and uh, <clears throat> one of Gurung's great studies was was the Indian place names. Uh, and Indian language. And here he is taking notes from, from Chief Paul. Um, and uh, it's, it's a lovely, it's, it's, it's a cartoon. Uh, the, the, the figure on the, on behind, uh, on the right there, smoking a pipe is, is Paul's wife. Uh, taking notes has been on. Um, and, more cartoons. Um, it was such a relief to get to cartoons because we know how handwriting. I, I read dozens of these uh, little diaries. Uh, it was very hard to read. So it was a great relief to get to cartoons. So I'm going to uh, blitz you with a few of them. Uh, and you can see that these are mishaps on the, on the, on the, on the river. Um, and the figure on the right here making fun, of course, is going on himself. Um, 
Mm -hmm. So we're back. Yeah. Um, well, the, well um, these are poachers uh, fleeing, uh, fleeing from game wardens on the on one of the rivers in northern New Brunswick. Um, and in the left-hand page, there are um, two herbs. They're not, they aren't, they aren't, they um, aren't, they aren't Malasites. They are, they are Europeans. They are fishing illegally, of course, um, attracting the salmon in the, in the river with the with the fire at the front of the canoe and uh, and the, the man behind is standing with his harpoon. Uh, on the next on the next page you can see good honest handwriting there it's very difficult to read. So what I usually did was photograph the pages I wanted to look at in more detail, take them home uh, and uh, Enter it, put them in my own computer, and blow them up. Uh, but that, that's the only way I could I could read much of his handwriting. Uh, it, uh, it's very, it's very, it's very. Um, it looks lovely, but it's very hard to read. On the right hand side, there's a canoe which, uh, using a um, a, a small uh, evergreen, a sort of spruce, as a as a sail. Uh, every summer for 35 or 40 years, uh, Gnong and a, a companion explored the, uh, the New Brunswick bush, the New Brunswick interior. Um, much of it had never been, so most of it had never been that. And he did so by, by canoe. And when they were moving quickly, they didn't, they didn't put up tents. They just, as you can see, uh, turned the canoe off, off, off its side, uh, draped, a, draped the canvas, the sail over it. Uh, and that was their the, the, the lodging for the, for the night. Uh, Finan named his uh, camps. And this one is named Camp Smith College. Uh, next one is. Oh, this one here. Uh, when uh, they had time to spare, when they were spending several days at one place, uh, they put up a tent. And every night, uh, Ganong made notes a diary of the day's activities. And here you see him doing, doing just that. Uh, this is one of Ganon's favorite companions. Um, um, who was a fellow, a fellow botanist. Um, and uh, his name is escaping me for a moment. It's your short hair, it's your hair, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, he was a, uh, was a, he had a, he had a very career. He was sometimes a journalist, sometimes a schoolmaster, but he was a very good botanist. And he uh, he became the president of the Canadian Bot Botanical Society. Uh, he was such a good botanist that that, uh, uh, that Ganong was his was his was his helpmate. He, he he did all the canoeing so that uh, so that he could write notes. They did all the cooking and the, the, the figure, the, the back you can see uh, just beyond the hay is Ganong's back. He's, he's cooking, cooking supper. 
Um, this one? Yeah. Good. Uh, this is um, Ganong. This is standing on the only feature that was, I think the only feature that was ever named for him, New Brunswick. Um, um, it's Mount Canon. It's not, not truly a mountain, it's, uh, but there aren't real, true mountains in northern New Brunswick. They are simply sort of large hills. Uh, this one has been burnt over. Um, and uh, it was named for him by this man, uh, Moran Furbish. Uh, Furbish uh, was from Massachusetts. Uh, uh, and he was a, a professional map maker. One of his um, one of his skills was map making. Uh, he was a professional map maker, and he mapped in the territory that Gunon, in which Gunon spent his summers. And he and Gunon met in 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 north central New Brunswick. And they took to each other immediately. Um, Furbish, as you can see, probably, I think you can see from my face, was as, was as determined as, as Ganong. Uh, uh, um, and they, when they met, they, they fell on each other. They recognized it, uh, that they were like, sort of like-minded, like souls. And they spent several summers together uh, mapping uh, unmapped parts of, of New Brunswick. Uh, in the winter uh, months, uh, Burbish had uh, was a supplier to uh, to fishermen, and he made uh, uh, he made fishing lines. Uh, as you see water with the enamel fly lines, um, but in the summers he he spent he went into into the bush mapping un, unmapped areas. Uh, and he spent several years in, in New Brunswick. Um, oh, this is a, was another summer companion, and in some way, an unfortunate one. Um, the, the, this man, his name is Arthur Pierce, uh, and he was the psychology uh, professor at Smith College. Uh, he was also a photographer, and his favorite subjects as a photographer was wildlife. So he accompanied Benong on many summers, six or seven summers. And he swore after each one that he'd never go back again, because he said, I think the word he used was a dog's body. <laughs> he did much of the hauling and dealing, while Benong did much of the much of the skilled work. I'm sure he was exaggerating, but you can see it there that, that he is laden. And what they're doing, what he's doing is carrying the equipment from one uh, canoeing place, uh, from one launching place to another. Um, um, and uh, he, he got rather tired of it. Here he is in uh, in uh, in Northampton, outside his house in Northampton, he uh, he's obviously going roaring. I suspect on the on the connected river, um, but I'm not quite sure. But sadly, um, um, he died. He died after this photograph was taken. He he caught pneumonia. Uh, and in the pneumonia in those days it was, it was, it was, of course, a very serious disease. He never recovered from it. Um, so Ganon lost a very, a very loyal, uh, very loyal companion. Uh, most of the uh, portaging between river systems uh, Ganong's companions could do another, they could carry the canoes. New Brunswick is, New Brunswick rivers are very accommodating for, for explorers because they are intermeshed. 
in such a way that the distances between headwaters was very small, which meant that when all and where, whoever was with him, and he always had a companion um, in case of accident, they were able to carry their canoes from one headwater to another. But for longer portages, they needed help, of course, and here they're being helped by a, by a, by a, uh, uh, a horse and cart. Uh, Gnon, as was his wont, wont, made drawings whenever he could. Uh, and this is a portage over what, what, one, mile rips, one mile rapids over which it's too long to carry a canoe. Uh, and here again is a horse and cart and Gnon cannot resist, uh, cannot resist a jest. And in the bottom there you see a figure uh, stretched out uh, resting, probably knowing himself, actually. Um, Ganong got to a point where he couldn't canoe, he got too old to canoe, he became too dangerous. He was afraid of breaking a leg in the wilderness and, uh, and um, not recovering from it, not being able to get help. So as he got older, he, he switched from uh, canoes to uh, a Model T4, uh, one of which he had into made what the British call a shoot, shooting brick in which he could, in which he could uh, sleep. Uh, in this, in, in the photo, he's he's here. He's about sixty, I think. Uh, and with him is his second wife, uh, Anna. Um, his first wife died when she was relatively young, Susan uh, Muriel Palmer. Um, uh, and Anna was a, a geologist, an instructor in geology at Smith. And she came from Iowa. And that's her sitting beside Gnome. And she accompanied him on on many of his field trips when he when he when he took his his model T. Uh, Ganong uh, was a photographer, and in front of him you see his camera on a on a tripod. He was he was he was quite a good photographer. Uh, this is a. Um, uh, a photograph of a French family, and I, I, I want to make an apology here because I, I, I should have got hold of a, uh, a photograph of Doshis Island because Ganon was one of the few historians, early historians, who took much interest in, in the French in the Acadians. Uh, and this is a, an Acadian family in the northeast of New Brunswick near the North Shore, uh, whom Binong uh, uh, got to know and to like. And he loved this photograph, he makes in the notes and because of the way the father's hand is cupped around the face of the of the boy. Uh, the boy is trying to hide, is <laughs> burrowing his way into his father's waist and leg. Uh, and it's, it's a lovely, lovely photograph. And you note that there are one, two, three, four, there are five children there, uh, all under the age of, I would say, seven. Um, Ganong uh, wrote a great deal about the French exploration uh, and French settlement in, in New Brunswick. Uh, he, he translated uh, several of Champlain's journals, uh, and also the journals um, uh, of Nicholas Denis. Um, the journals were written, were written in old French, Acadian French, and to translate them, Vinong had to get the help of a French prop at, at Smith. The um, uh, the 
photograph of Dolce Island uh, would have interested because, uh, because uh, um, it was in in it was in, in American territory. The 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 main U.S. main Nebraska border runs down the mid channel of the of the of the of the St. Croix and Doshes Island is in the St. Croix River and Doshes Island was the island uh, that Champlain and his crew wintered on in 1604-1605. And I wish I had a a photograph of it because Pam Beveridge told me that, uh, from Pam Beveridge, I learned that that one of the owners of the, uh, the owner of of the island uh, after the French had left uh, was, a brewer family, uh, and the brewers had had Northampton connections. Um, the uh, the as you probably know the 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 Champlain Island settlement didn't, didn't last. It lasted only a winter actually, because scurvy and um, and a very cold winter uh, um, drove them off. And they crossed the Bay of Fundy. Um, uh, Ganon also translated the work of um, Nicholas Denis, uh, who was a, uh, a trader on the Atlantic coast of New Brunswick in the 17th century. And his trade was in cod and furs. And Denis wrote a, went back to France, and in France he wrote a, an 800 page journal. In, in what Gnong described as execrable French, but Gnong's French was fluent. Uh, and Gnong, with the help of, of uh, a professor at Smith, translated Nicholas Denis's journal. Uh, and Gnong uh, said he was a privilege to do it, even though it was written in execrable prose. Um, and, and a privilege because it was filled with with valuable information about the fishery, uh, the fishery and about uh, and about uh, uh, fur trapping and, and trading. Um, the the figure on the left is uh, her name is you can see Fanny Fanny Harding Harding uh, The figure on the right is uh, John Clarence Webb. So these were Two of Gnong's great friends. Um, Fanny Hardy Action was the daughter of, um, of a fur trader uh, and naturalist. And it was through uh, uh, his connection with the father that, 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 that Gnong got to know Fanny. Uh, Fanny was a graduate of Smith College. She graduated in 1888, before before Benon got there. Uh, and um, married a clergyman and was widowed quite early. And I, I learned from uh, Pat, Pat Beveridge that she spent some time in Eastport. Uh, but her, most of her life, uh, her adult life was spent in Brewer. And after her husband died, uh, she was her funds, she took up or continued her studies of folklore uh, and uh, and and Indian, I can say Indian here because you <laughs> still use the word in in the states, Indian culture, uh, the passive body culture. Uh, and she was a scholar in her own right. She wrote a book on the on the passive bodies, on the place names of the passive bodies. Um, and uh, which was very well received. But she uh, regarded her life work as providing Ganon with information on, 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 on Aboriginal, on the Aboriginals. Um, and when he, di- when he died, she said, my, my, <laughs> um, uh, it was my great privilege to, to, to provide Gong, uh, Professor Gong with, with information on, 
on the on the Aboriginals. Um, uh, the figure on the right is also a great became a great friend of Bernard's. Uh, he and his, he he's a uh, Brunswicker, and his career was rather similar to, to in some ways similar to, to Grenon's. Uh, his name is John Clarence Webster, and he was born in Shediac on the Atlantic shore uh, of New Brunswick. And he went to Mount Allison University, and from Mount Allison, he he went to uh, Germany to to Munich. Uh, to study medicine. Uh, and in Germany, he, he, he specialized in, uh, in gynecology. Uh, and from Munich, he went first of all to the Gill, where he taught uh, at the uh, Gill Hospital, uh, gynecology and obstetrics. And from there, to the University of Chicago, uh, to a hospital that was associated, I think it was, the name was Rush, associated with the uh, University of Chicago. And uh, he, uh, he wrote uh, many books on, on, his, on his specialty, uh, gynecology and obstetrics. And, um, uh, and he also had a a, a, uh, a private practice. So I think a, a, a flourishing private practice. Anyway, uh, where's John Clarence Webster? Uh, in his mid or late fifties, announced that he was giving up gynecology and obstetrics, resigning, and going back to New Brunswick to study its history. Uh, he said I, at school, all, the only history we got was, uh, was British colonial history, nothing, nothing at all uh, on the history of New Brunswick. And he was going to uh, make up for this loss of time. His Chicago colleagues, at, both at the university and at the hospital, thought he was mad. Um, and they, kept his position open, but the hospital kept his position open for a year, um, certain that he would, he would come back. But uh, Webster never returned. He, he became in his own right an important uh, his New Brunswick historian, writing, writing many books. Uh, and uh, became a great friend of, of Ganong's, although Ganong at first wanted nothing to do with Webster. Ganon, uh, Ganon uh, shunned away from celebrities. I think he, 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 he kept clear of academics as much as he could. But he was much, much more comfortable with, with, with ordinary folk. Whereas Webster was, as you can tell from the photograph, he was quite obviously a patrician. This was taken in his study. Uh, and it occurred to me that literary analogues for uh, for for Ganon and Webster would be Thomas Hardy and Henry James. Thomas Hardy, the uh, both they were both nineteenth century novels. Thomas Hardy, Thomas Hardy subjects were country people, country folk, uh, shepherds, uh, uh, farmers, woodsmen. Uh, whereas Ganon. Um, um, whereas, uh, whereas Henry James's his subjects were the gentry, uh, and uh, Ganong and, and James, uh, when reviewing one of Hardy's books, was puzzled why anyone with Hardy's talents would write about country bumpkins. You didn't, I don't, you didn't use the term bumpkins, but but country people, simple country people, uh, and. Hardy, uh, Hardy's response was, was that uh, <laughs> uh, it's far more interesting than writing uh, about uh, uh, or than recording, uh, you know, 
tittle tattle, um, um, the tittle tattle of gentry of gentry uh, tea parties. Uh, so Gidon was the was the patrician, and I'm sorry, Wimsey was the patrician, and Gidon the woodsman. Uh, and Wimsey had great difficulty getting hold of Gidon. He invited him to his house. Um, uh, several summers, and Gnon always made an excuse, so I'm busy in the woods. Uh, and Gnon said, well, well, come into the woods and meet me, but Webster, of course, wouldn't be seen dead in the woods. <laughs> and to meet Gnon, he had to go to uh, to Northampton. Um, uh, and uh, went to Gnon's house, and they became, they became great friends. And they were the co-founders of the New Brunswick uh, Museum. Which is in St. John. And Gunnar's collection was the founding collection of the, of the museum. Uh, uh, Gunnar died before Webster, and Webster um, gave the oration at his uh, at the memorial service at the University of New Brunswick. Um, uh, quoting from uh, Kipling. Uh, of whom Gnon was a, a great admirer. Um, and I'll read you just briefly um, a quote here. Now, this is from George Eliot's uh, Quatrain and it, from the novel Victoria. And it, it reads our, our life was but a little holding, lent to do a mighty labor. We are one with heaven and the stars when it is spent to serve God's aim, else we die with the sun. Uh, Ganon's, uh, Webster's admiration for Ganon was, was, was enormous. And we're almost at the end here. Here we are. Uh, after uh, my book on Gnome came out, I gave a talk in St. Stephen, Gnome's hometown. And uh, as I should say, it was a very small audience for the, for the talk. Gnome is almost unknown in St. Stephen. And at the talk was David Gnome, the current president of the Gnome. Uh, chocolate um, manufacturing. And during the talk, I complained to that there was nothing at all in St. Stephen to suggest that Gnome had ever lived there, had ever grown up there. Uh, and Gnome is universally regarded. New Brunswick, anyway, as the province's greatest scholar. I mentioned New Brunswick's name and the, the, the standard response, and I said, you could be your observed greatest scholar. Anyway, nothing in St. Stephen to, to suggest that he had any connection with the place. So the next day, <laughs> when I got home, David Gnall phoned me and said, I'm going to get a statue made of my great uncle. So we formed a small committee uh, and raised the money for the statue. And he didn't want his company to pay for it. He wanted the province to, uh, to put up the funds. And David Gnome was very successful at raising money and raised enough to get this statue made by two New Brunswick sculptors from Sussex. And the statue is it's on the bank of the St. Croix River in front of the new civic center at St. Stephen, and Ganong is looking, looking upstream. Thank you. That was, thank you for listening. That's perhaps enough monologue. Um, if you have questions, I'd be glad to answer them. But before doing that, I, I'd like to thank Pam Beveridge for arranging this. I'd also thank, like to thank the Charlotte County Archives uh, for hosting it, as I am utterly hopeless with a computer. 
Uh, I've never talked to a screen in my life, which is quite obvious from my presentation. Uh, so I'm grateful to Heather Wilson uh, for her services at the, at the archives. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be delighted to try and answer them. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Professor Reese, for that presentation. And we do indeed have some questions and observations by some of our uh, uh, guests here. If, uh, if Matt could uh, uh, take down the, the presentation. Great, perfect. Um, so let me see, we, we have several questions and or comments here. Uh, first oh. off, brief, briefly from uh, Stephen Sanfilippo of, of Pembroke, Maine. He says, greetings from Pembroke, Maine, where there are many Ganons. Um, so I, I, I didn't realize there was a, a cross-border family as well. <laughs> um, we, I, I have, I'm going to privilege myself with a very brief question before we get into some more involved questions, which, which is, where do the Ganongs hail from? How, how did they come to New Brunswick? Oh, they, they, Huguenot French is about all I know. Uh, oh. they, came by, they came by the States. They came by America to, to, to St. Stephen. But, uh, to, to St. John, I'm sorry. Uh, but that's all I know about them. Um, but they are an old Huguenot family. I, I can add it. I can add a dimension to that. <laughs> <laughs> this is David Hello. Hello. <laughs> family. <laughs> I hope I didn't say anything rude about you. <laughs> <laughs> um, they were Huguenot French, uh, escaped uh, before getting burnt at the cross, uh, came out of uh, Rotterdam, uh, uh, settled in New Ro Rochelle, New York, as farmers. And in those days, the, the spelling was G-U-E-E-N-G, -E -E Gnung. And over mm -hmm. the time, it changed to Gnung. They became United Empire Loyalists after 1776. Um, maybe a strange thing for a, a Frenchman to become <laughs> United Empire Loyalist to go to Britain. But yeah. however, that, <laughs> that is what in, indeed happened. And they uh, settled outside of St. John in the Kingston Peninsula area, and then ultimately part of the Ganongs, which uh, we heard from Mr. Reese a, a few moments ago, uh, settled down into the St. Stephen area. And uh, one of the reasons for, I think, pushing for the statue in St. Stephen that Ron just talked about uh, was uh, WF is, is buried in the St. Stephen uh, a Cemetery as well. So anyway, there, there. I hope I can answer that a little more specifically. <laughs> I meant to say he was buried in St. Stephen, and in character, the, 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 the gravestone is very plain, just his name on it and dates. Um, and Anagano, his wife, wanted something, something uh, more descriptive uh, relating to his great love of New Brunswick, but that, that never happened. Uh, and so it's a plain stone, which in, in fact would have pleased me on. Um, he didn't have solutions. This, this, this uh, about a month ago, another plaque, larger plaque was placed just behind the statue that had a little bit more explanation about WF mm -hmm. in both uh, 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 Passamaquoddy, uh, French and English. Wow. I, uh, at, at this point, uh, I've asked Mike Karen to uh, unmute, and he's got some uh, questions, which you can see in chat, that are uh, complex. And first off, Mike, um, you know a lot about Ganong, apparently, so t tell us who you are, uh, and then if you want to ask some of your questions, uh, which are fascinating. Uh, <laughs> I can't seem to figure out how, I too have problems with the computer. I can't figure out how to... Uh, uh, get my camera to be working here, but uh, I'll try to. Sorry, what 